when you said, I love you, what you are saying is that I'm choosing to be patient with you. I'm choosing to be kind to you. I'm choosing not to keep any records of wrong. I'm choosing to celebrate you and to believe the best of you. You are literally telling that person every time you say, I love you, you are saying 1 Corinthians 13. That's what you are saying. But you know, we have casualized those words so much that it doesn't make sense anymore. So when you tell somebody, I love you, it doesn't, doesn't connect. They just think it's a feeling. Love is not a feeling and it will never be a feeling. Pascal tried to explain that yesterday, so I won't go into it. But this morning, what I want to talk to you about is how important these two things God is saying. There are two things God really, really wants in marriage. And the first thing is God wants you to be faithful. Now, I'm an infidelity recovery specialist, and I have worked with many marriages that they have been cheating. And a lot of times, you see, what happens is that people don't understand how devastating it is on the other person and why God hates cheating so much. It's not just a sexual act. It's, just, it's not just a just sleep and clean out. Nobody go know. Do they measure it? How would they know? See, Satan is very smart. And I said to you yesterday that the person you're playing with is not playing with you. Satan is not just a nuisance. He's an enemy. And the difference between a nuisance and an enemy is that a nuisance wants to annoy you, but an enemy wants to destroy you. So Satan has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he will not be satisfied until you are dead. And that's why I always laugh at people when they think, oh, Satan is just making me sick. His end goal is not to make you sick. It is to kill you. He wants to steal your money. You will pay medical bills and that will not be enough for him because he's wicked. One of my friends would say, Satan is a bad Satan. For lack of a better descri description, the devil is a bad devil. He wants to destroy you and he wants to kill you. That's his plan. But we as Christians sometimes treat him as if oh, he just wants to annoy me. Satan is getting on my nerves. No, he's not getting on your nerves. He's your enemy. He's out to get you, whether you like it or not. So Satan comes with the lie that sex is nothing. And so a lot of young men have fallen into that trap. And listen, if you are single here and you are a man, I need to speak to you this morning. Virginity and sexual purity is not for women. It's for everybody. If men will stop putting pressure on women, there will be more virgins in the world, both sexes. God wants you to keep yourself pure, sexually pure, whether you are male or female. And the discipline you build before you get married is the discipline that you will use in marriage. Contrary to what you think, married men are more attractive than single men. You think that girls like you now because you're a fine boy. Get married first. Let one woman work on you, make you fresh, give you food, pray for you. You have the money. They've done all the work. Then you see all the small, small demons that they call themselves side chicks. They'll be coming out from everywhere. Even people that when you were single, you were toasting them. They did not look at you twice. That's when they will come out and be explaining who they are. You remember we met at, who cares where you met? And he passed. <laughs> so if you do not work on developing your self-control to affect your marriage. Second thing, why Satan pushes sex as a, it's not a big deal, is because he wants to destroy you. The Bible says that the adulterous woman will hunt for the precious soul. And adultery will reduce you to a piece of bread. You will become common. So all these things that men think that, oh, I'm the one, I'm the one, they chop up. Now you did the chop. They are eating your destiny and cleaning mouth. So all this one that you say you are, you are playing women, they are play, Satan is playing you. He's destroying you. And you are letting yourself open for all kinds of things. For diseases, for influence of spirits, all kinds of things are going on. And you are being distracted. And let me tell you, there's a destiny he's after. Tomorrow you'll become something great, but then you will have a secret you will always hide. Is that the kind of life that you want to live? And so God says, when you get married, I want you to guard the spirit of marriage. Don't cheat on your spouse, whether you're male or female. And let me tell you, men, I'm in this business, eh? Counseling couples. Women cheat more than men. Mm. Yes. Women cheat more than men. And let me also say this because I know this one you probably don't know. Married women cheat more. They say men are cheating, men are cheating. Are they cheating with men? 
This is not women they are cheating with. The average man, except there's something else doing you, the average man is cheating with a woman. And you see, these days, what they do, because you think you're a married man, you're smart. You say, ah, me, ah, ah, she won't know. As you two, you are going out. She too, she's going out. She has her own plan. And you see, most married women are cheating with other married people because we both have secrets. We don't want to disgrace ourselves. If you are sleeping with a single girl, she can decide to destroy you because she has nothing to lose. But another married woman, you know, say if she talk, you say, get her husband number. Uh -huh. So these things are, and unfortunately, they are creeping into the church. And usually, there are men who did not control themselves before they got married. There are women who did not control themselves before they got married. If you can't zip up before you get married, marriage will not change you. Marriage does not change anybody. You will not change, suddenly become, how do they say, a lizard before marriage does not become a crocodile. You just become a married lizard. <laughs> so if you are cheating before marriage, you will cheat after marriage. My husband always says it in a certain way. He says, a fornicator is a, an adulterer trainee. Yes. Because that thing has become a habit. And so it will enter into marriage with you. So God wants you to be faithful. The things, the damage it does, I don't have time today to, to have to tell you. People, their mental health literally breaks down. There's disease in the body. Some people develop insomnia, anxiety attacks, PTSD. I can, if you know the women I'm working with, totally destroyed. Why? Because one man cheated on you. And you won't, it may look like I'm waiting there. The damage is a lot. Because what happens is that you're already in covenant. If somebody's married, they're in covenant. And when you take your body and go and join with someone else, you're literally killing the person that you're in covenant with. You are breaking it every day. And what breaks you is death. I don't want to go into all that. The second thing that is very important to God, and I think should be important to all of us, is godly seed. So today I want to talk to you about what God really wants, which is godly seed. God wants godly seed. He wants godly children. He wants children of God. And you can only get children of God from godly parents. And parenting is a high calling. It's a partnership. And it starts from when you are single. When you are picking a partner, you need to ask yourself, is this the kind of person I want to be the mother of my children? Is this the kind of person I want to be the father of my children? Because a lot of people have sacrificed their children's destiny on the altar of marriage. As far as I like him. In fact, the one that even pays me the most is two people that are ASAS will be asking me where AS and AS and we love each other. Should we marry? And you can tell that that's a selfish question. Because what you will produce is SS children. But it doesn't concern you. It doesn't concern you because you're not the one that will have crisis. It doesn't concern you because you're not the one that will be in pain. You say, but we love each other. And now they even have the audacity to give murder a name by saying, oh, Pastor, don't worry, we'll do gender selection. So which of your children will you kill? Je Je Jesse, David, Mary, or Josephine? Because every child has a destiny. He says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So don't let medical science deceive you into thinking, ah, it doesn't matter, we'll just choose, if we just check and just see that uh, his SS, we'll just take the baby out. One person actually asked me that question. I said, so you want to become a murderer because of marriage? Not that there are no AA men in the world, but you are impatient or you are selfish. So as a single person, ask yourself, is this the kind of person that I want to be the father of my children? This is the kind of person. I see the Bible says that everything produces after its kind. That was God's original plan. When he made birds, his plan was that birds would produce after their kind. There are some men. Nobody should help them reproduce after their kind. <laughs> they didn't day, sir. Do you know the meaning of they didn't day? It means they did not day. <laughs> they are not among. They are no follow. They should, their generation should end with them. Because the amount of evil, frustration, ungodliness should not be moved to the next generation. And you know, the Bible is very clear. The Bible will tell you, and Abraham begat 
uh, Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat. Are you not seeing that there's a trend? There's a begatting. Begatting means that whatever he got, he begat it <laughs> to the next generation. So if he's a man of faith, he will be got it the way you become. So you'll be God to your children. And your child will take that faith and also be God to the next one. But you, you do not see man of faith, though. You do not see a man that loves the Lord. You do not see a godly man. You do not see any of that type. You want to carry the one that does not have behavior. And you want to be got him. Some of you should help us to end the nonsense that is going on in this world. It should be your responsibility. So when you are choosing, make up your mind that this person, I can't help this person to reproduce after his kind. And don't be calling us, don't call us to come and talk to anybody who can't say, see, there are some things you should run away from. When you are single, it's such a beautiful season. I wish people would just enjoy it. When you are single, you can just say, I don't want and be going. When you are married, you'll be there. You will say, pray, partner with Jesus. He is a son of God too. God loves him too. Confess the word. Buy a person book, praying for your husband. Buy a That's what you'll be doing. But you see, you can avoid it. Because that your faith, you will use faith. Because the just shall live by his faith. But that your faith, your means are using to buy a house. You, you are using to correct your husband's head. And if he begat, that means you will do it with your children. And if that one begat, you will do it with your grandchildren. Why do you like to suffer in life? Your mates are using prayer to do great things for God. It's every day. Oh, my husband, do it, do it, do it. God said, when, when you were saying, I do, now do it. Now me, the God, to come do it. Now you do. So from the beginning, that choice of who you marry, because parenting is partnership. It takes two godly people to bring forth godly children. And mind you, when I say godly, godly children, I'm not just talking about well-behaved children. I'm talking about intentionally raising firebrands for Jesus. I'm talking about raising children who will answer the enemy at the gates. I'm talking about raising children who have an understanding of destiny and their calling and their assignment in life. So parenting is partnership. Parenting is not a woman's job. Please help me. If you are sitting around a man, help me tell him. Mm. There's one man in the Bible that really amuses me. There's a woman in the Bible, the, the Shunammite, um, she was a Shunammite woman. And this woman did not have children. She went to her husband and told her husband that, ah, this prophet Elisha that passes here, I, I perceive in my spirit that he's a man of God. Let's build a house for him. Let's put a table and a chair and a bed and let him be comfortable anytime he passes here. And the husband said, anyone? I'm sure that man was phlegmatic. He said, if you like, build now. It's okay. It's not a problem. She built the house. Elisha, ah, Elisha entered the house when he saw the place that they built for him. Ah, he said, this woman. He said, no, this venison that my soul loves, I want to prophesy. He said, what do you want? The woman said, I don't want anything. No. I live among my own people. I do business. I'm okay. He said, can I speak to the king? He said, no, I don't have a problem at all. Then Gehazi, I'm a boy. May God send Gehazis that can do, that can really tell God what you need. Whether it is for his own good or not, and she shall do that a favor. Now told the man of God that she doesn't have child. Though. Man of God say, what? If I be a man of God. And I said, by this time next year, the woman said, hey. he said, I'm telling you, by this time next year, true to his word, this woman got pregnant. She is a miracle child. She said, when you have miracle child, everybody should be involved. I still remember when, <laughs> when my first daughter, even, even up to diaper, pass, okay, change. You know when you waited for child for a long time? Even up to pampas. Smelling people like this, pass, okay, will be changing it with joy. <laughs> because you've waited for this child. And so this child was with his father in the field. And one day the boy said, my head, my head. Father said, take him to his mother. Ah, sir, are you with us at all? <laughs> Are you not the head of this home? They've given you son. You finally begat. They gave you son now. Because it was a major thing. In, I mean, not like now. In those days, it was a major thing to have sons. She didn't even just give you a child. She gave you sons. Because if you even look at all the line names, before you will see a woman's name there. It's always men they begat. I don't know whether women were not begat. 
or we are just the begatters. Okay. But they don't call women there. This woman gave birth to a son and brought the son. And the son was useful to him because the son was with him in the field working. And then the boy says, my head, my head. He said, take him to his mother. Do you want to marry and take him to his mother? And they took the boy truly to his mother. And his mother laid him. He was there on his mother's lap and he died. Because his father said, take him to his mother. His father did not say, put his hand on his head and say, in the name of Jesus, how can your only hope, your only eye, say, my head, my head, he said, take him to his mother. That's when I look at men like that. I'm really fascinated when women want to marry. How do you have a challenge? And one of my friends told me she was in labor and her husband was crying. She said she was so angry. <laughs> he was crying. Hey, how is he doing? She said, no, be your mates. Now they put hand for their wife. They say, child, I speak to you. Die speedily in the name of Jesus. You. you are here crying. I say, eh, the problem is when you marry a dog and expect him to be a lion. A dog can only bark. He can't roar. So ask yourself, the person I want to join myself, can he parent with me? Can he sense that, oh, this child, this is what God is saying about this child. This is who this child is going to be. Beyond the physical things. I'm always very intri intrigued by parents these days. You're looking for the best schools for your children, not the best church. Church, school where they only teach them English. You need to find a church where they can grow in the things of God. Because that's our identity, that's who we really are. All this other school and work and everything, it's not, they will still go back to eternity and meet God and they know nothing about him. So the first thing you need to ask yourself is this person that I want to pick, can they parent with me? Apart from even spiritual things, physical things, some women know no book, sha. <laughs> I will go there. So women know no book. They like, they like makeup. They think makeup is so. Let me tell you, makeup does not do homework. Right. Right. Ah. And the homework they used to give in school these days, it's not the children, no. it's the parents. It's as if they are saying, eh, hey, you, you want rest. You send your children to school morning to night, you go walk. They will think they are doing revenge. If you see the homework they give them, they will meet them, they will not give them project. When I was growing up, it's university they used to do project though. Now, and it's project the children cannot understand. Mommy, mommy, I say, see, you carry this thing back to your teacher because people cannot frustrate me. May you not do homework with your children and they fail it in school. And the interesting thing, give me Genesis 18, 19. And the interesting thing, give it to me in King, uh, New King James. And the interesting thing is that scientists have found that, that children take their mother's brain. So if your wife, when you won't marry, no, no book. <laughs> Sir, I'm just saying, we consider. Because it will be a disaster. If you're picking no notebook. <laughs> Genesis 18, 19. Like I said, parenting is not a woman's job. It's a partnership. And it's a high calling. This is God speaking here. He says, for I have known him. I was talking about Abraham. In order that he may command his children and his household after him. That he may command them after him. Not follow your mother to church. And before you go, go downstairs, buy me two bottles of beer. That's what you want to marry. God boasting about Abraham. He said he will come out. He didn't say Sarah. Mm. I don't know where the, where the church got it that women raise children. We raise them, but daddy, you, you are the one that gives them identity. We may give them, we may not show them, but you give them their nature. They should see that daddy is submitted to God. They should see you on your face worshiping God so they know that God is the highest. If you can't pray, why do you want your children to pray? If they don't see that when there's an issue, you have a God that you call on, why do you think they will call on God? Why don't you think they will look for other options? He says that he may command his children. Is it that he may suggest to his children? Command. Instruct. Because these days now, children, you can't tell them anything, no. In school, all these Oibo people, Western world, 
They say you, you can't tell your children no. It will affect their self-esteem. Mm. They say we can't tell them no. So if the child wants to put hand in fire, it's exploration. Allow him to explore. When he puts his hand in the fire, I me, mean, I can't go to hospital, so you will not put your hand in fire. There's nothing wrong with no. No is a beautiful thing. I had no a lot in my life, so I value yes. They say we cannot beat our children. The Bible says foolishness abounds in the child. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the rod of what? Correction. There's a rod of correction. Not the rod of wickedness, so. Not the rod of hot temper. What is the motive behind the rod? Is what makes the rod important. It's a rod of correction. Mm. Say so if you spare the rod, you what? You spoil the child. And let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with children crying. My mother-in-law is a retired matron. She told me one day, she said, you know the kid children, when they open their lung. <laughs> they expand their lung. Is they okay, leave and make it cry. And let me tell you, if your children don't cry, you, that you are an adult, you will cry. So it's better that they cry now and learn the right thing. So all the people that are giving you all this advice that is contrary to the scriptures, Look at their own children. How are their own children? God says, I want godly seed. I want godly seed. There's a way. There's a godly way to raise children. I'm not saying go around and don't be beating your children. But when I look at all these evil people, they just, the child will just come in. Bob, don't be silly. Hey. I can't take it. It's when I think of all these things here, eh? I sometimes I don't be tempted to just go and just beat my children down. Just <laughs> let me just beat you down before you offend. So that even when, even when you go to school, I had a friend when she was in um, secondary school. She got back to school and that, you know, at the beginning of, I don't know how secondary schools are now, but at the time when you get back to school, you guys will do labor, you clear grass and all that. Now they don't do other things. So. Or oh, they have gardeners who mow the lawn. What does they don't do other things again? So they got to school and they told them to mow to cut grass. And then all the people in her class were like, "I'm not cutting grass." Everybody now disappeared. It was a day school, so they all just ran home. She too, she followed them. Unfortunately for her, her mother was at home when she ran into her house because all the children dispersed and went home because they don't want to cut grass. So she got home and her mother said, "Ah." What are you doing? Why are you back now? She said, ah, that they wanted to cut grass in school. And so everybody rioted and they came home. My mother said, ah, you followed them. She said, yes. So, okay, your food is in the kitchen. Go inside. The next morning, she was in class. Early morning, her mother walked into the school. Good morning, ma. God bless you, ma. Say, hey. Say, please, eh, teacher. They say, yes, they even told them to say, yes, ma. And what happened? They say, rioted. Say, was my daughter there? Say, yes, God, her mother said, please. Can I borrow your cane? Her mother flogged her in front of the class. And told her, say, others may, you cannot. So after that day, even when everybody said they're not cutting grass, you don't see her in the corner. Because me, I know the mama way born me. There are counsel your parents give you that stays with you. There are those 3 a.m. conversations. You see, that flogging, it did much more than we're having conversation. When they flog that, even when I have brain reset, the God that created us says that foolishness abounds in the heart of a child. And the only thing that can take it out is a resetting. You say we should be having conversation. God say hit the rock. You want to speak to the rock. Go ask Moses how that ended. God knows exactly what he's talking about. But no, we want to Igbo style. Bob, don't be silly. Why are you such a big bitch? Imama na they tell you. Mama we born now. There was there was one one um, there's one series they do on TV where there's a woman that comes something nanny I can't remember that she comes to teach people how to raise how to raise their children. So this particular woman, her her children don't like to go to bed in their room. So, so the first, first night she came, so they will, if you put them in bed, they will run out and go and sleep in her bed. And so she was a bit frustrated. So she brought this nanny. The nanny now said, you know what you do? You put them in bed. When they come out, you take them back and say, I need you to stay in your bed. You come back and read, I need you to stay in your bed. Even me, we watch her. All 
night. This, this is what they, they did, did all night. All night. You know, at some point, person can say, if them truly them be this children, they will cry sleep. All day sleep. And I just felt, really, this is the solution. Because the time, the woman now didn't sleep all night. Because every time they come, and that happened about seven times. They will come out, they will go back, come and go back. So even when the woman, the nanny now left, the nanny said, if you do this for a few days, you'll be okay. By the third day, the children slept in their room, but around 5 a.m. in the morning, by that time, she was almost... By the time the nanny left, all of them, they sleep for the room. See, today, everybody's okay. But if they had flogged those children, it would be all right. And flogging doesn't kill anybody. Maybe they beat you, are you dead? They'll say we are traumatized. Nigeria itself is trauma. It's not the one that your parents beat you in the house that is traumatized. Everybody's traumatized. Now, like I said, I'm not saying go around and just be beating your children. That's not what I'm saying. But when it is necessary, do not spare the rod and spoil the child. Because we have a lot of spoiled children. Spoiled, rotten. As they say in my place, though they're rotten, they say they're ripe. Children are, are spoiled, rotten. They say, oh, they're just intelligent. No, they're not. They're rude. We have children who are so badly behaved. And when I was growing up, it took a village. When you offend, before you go anywhere, your auntie don't beat you for roads. But now, you can't tell anybody, anybody that, oh, your child did You can't. You can't. You can't even correct a child. The other day, one of our leaders in church said she, one of the teenage girls was talking to a boy. She told the girl that you're too young to have a boyfriend. Say, please, my mother knows about it. So, if her mother knows about it, who are you, ma? In other words, she's telling you, and say, please, mind your business. In our time, they will rush you, then go and do meeting on your mother's head. All you want is to gather her. After the finish meeting, you'll be there. Say you want to spoil for our family. No. Things have changed. And that's not the Bible. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And the rod of correction will drive it far. Not near, far. If the foolishness wants to come back, when the child remembers the rod of correct, it will, it will run far. So parenting is a high calling.